Hi everyone. Today I'd like to talk about the history of one of my favourite watches, the Cartier Tank. Now, Cartier is quite a controversial brand within the watch world, with many dismissing it as simply a fashion brand or a jeweller that happens to make watches. I disagree with this, mainly because Cartier is credited with creating one of the first modern wristwatches for men, when an early Brazilian aviator, Alberto Santos Dumont, asked his friend, Louis Cartier, to design him a wristwatch, as operating a pocket watch during flight was too difficult. The rest is, as they say, history with Cartier creating the Santos in 1904. In my opinion, this cements Cartier's position within the world of horology. The tank closely followed the Santos. In this video, I'll be going through the history and iconic design of the Cartier tank, followed by the various movement options the watch has featured throughout the years. A chronology of some notable people who have worn this watch, including Andy Warhol, Frank Sinatra and Muhammad Ali, will be described followed by a discussion on the relatively affordable pricing of both new and vintage models on the market. As always, I've included timestamps in the description below, so please feel free to jump to whichever part you're most interested in. The Cartier Tank prototype was first produced in 1917. The name and design of the watch is inspired by the French Renault FT17 tank, first used in World War I. At the time, this was a truly innovative piece of technology and the first tank to house its weapon in a fully rotating turret. A top view of the FT-17 shows how the tank tracks protrude from the body itself. This resembles how the elongated lugs of the watch protrude from and enclose the dial. The watch itself features Roman numeral hour markers, tank track minute markers, blued steel breguet hands, a deployment buckle, which by the way is a Cartier invention, and the signature sapphire cabochon crown. In 1918, Cartier gifted the tank to US General John Pershing. One year later, just before the start of the 1920s, this early model became publicly available by Cartier from its Paris boutique, with six pieces initially made. It's important to remember that Cartier at this time was not the huge company we see today, rather a small family-owned business inherited by three brothers from their father Alfred. The store in Paris was run by Louis himself, whereas a store in New York and London were run by his brothers Pierre and Jacques, respectively. In 1921, Cartier introduced the tank Cintre. This was an elongated version of the Normal, with added curves that hug the wrist. The Cintre model was typically produced in limited editions, meaning it remained one of the most collectible amongst the different tank variants. The Cintre was followed up by several models, including in 1922 the iconic Louis Cartier or LC tank, and the Chinois, inspired by ancient Chinese temples. The tank Savonnier was released in 1926, and finally, my favourite, the tank Aguiche, released in 1928. This model took the case of the tank LC, but obscured the dial with a sheet of brushed yellow or white gold with two small windows called guichets in France, the upper one showing the jump hours and the window below displaying the minutes. The Great Depression of the 1930s affected Cartier financially, but did not hinder it creatively. In fact, the 1930s opened with three new models, the most popular being the Tank 8 Hours. With a double barrel movement that provided an 8-day power reserve, the watch was very technically advanced for its time. In fact, it beats the power reserve offered by most modern mechanical watches today. It was produced in very small numbers, meaning like the Sintre, it's highly collectible. It had an estimated value of over 100,000 US dollars by Antiquorum back in 1998. Whilst Cartier survived the Great Depression of the early 30s, the brand and the world itself was about to be challenged with the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939. The Nazis occupied Paris and the Cartier headquarters was cut off from its London and New York branches. And that wasn't all, as soon after the outbreak of war, in 1942, both Jacques and Louis died, leaving just Pierre Cartier in New York. He returned to Paris after the war and oversaw the restructuring of the business. But post-war austerity in France hit consumers hard, and the business struggled. Pierre died in 1964, and soon after, the Cartier family sold on the business. The boutiques were again isolated and in the hands of different owners. It wasn't until 1976, the year of the first Concorde flight, that all three Cartier stores were once again reunited under one ownership. Just one year later, the United Cartier brand launched the Le Must de Cartier collection. The Must tank replaced the classic opaline white with lacquer in deep red, 
blue, black and a series of other strong shades. They also made the watch much cheaper, using gold-plated silver, also known as vermeil, rather than precious metals like gold. This proved a huge commercial success and is widely regarded as a watch that saved Cartier. From the 80s onwards, Cartier released the Tank Americane in 1989, a bigger, bolder take on the elongated rectangle of the 1920s century. The Tank Francais in 1996 introduced an assertive square case and chunky metal bracelet. In 2002, Cartier flipped the tank on its side with a divan. This striking design was quickly discontinued and is hence now very collectible. The trilogy of models, representing Cartier's three international divisions, was eventually completed by the Tank Anglais in 2012. This watch remains in the Tank de Cartier collection till this day, which also features the iconic Louis Cartier, the more modern, robust and beefier Tank American and Tank Francais, the sportier Tank MC released in 2013, the Tank Solo, which builds upon the design philosophy of the LC released in 2004, and finally, the undeniable Tank Sintre. The history of the movements found inside the tank is also very interesting. Edmund Jaeger had designed movements for many of the great watchmaking firms, but his closest relationship was with Louis Cartier. The movements that Jaeger designed were manufactured by the Swiss firm of Lacoutte. Together, Louis and Jaeger formed a movement design and manufacturing business called European Watch and Clock, or EWC. The new firm was created on November 15, 1919, shortly after the public release of the first tank watches, meaning that for the first few months of production, the Lakuta produced, Jaeger-designed EWC movements inside the tank went unsigned. During the Great Depression of the 30s, however, things got so bad for Cartier that in 1933, the Lakut contract with the EWC company was cancelled by the Swiss firm as Cartier was not keeping its side of the deal by ordering a sufficient amount of movements. Cartier worked with other high-end movement manufacturers during this period. In the late 70s and early 80s, with the advent of cheaper, more accurate quartz movements, the entire Swiss and mechanical watchmaking industry was under pressure. Known as a quartz crisis, many manufacturers went out of business. Cartier, being the resilient, enterprising and innovative brand that had survived two world wars and several economic recessions, used the crisis to its benefit, creating the Muster Cartier range featuring quartz movements and re-equipping many of its old models with newer quartz movements. This was an early move in the democratisation of the luxury watch market that we probably now take for granted. As the quartz crisis ended, Cartier reverted back to sourcing its movements from other high-end manufacturers such as JLC, Piaget and Blancpain. However, Cartier often faced problems in getting all the parts from their manufacturers on time and this led to delays in watch releases. Cartier realised that in order to take the next step in watchmaking, they had to start producing their own movements. To tackle this problem head-on, Cartier founded a 30,000 square metre movement manufacturing site in La Chaux de Fonds and started to work with a selected group of watchmakers in 2005. This group was led by Carol Forestier Casapi, the genius watchmaker who has worked at Olmas Piguet and Von Cleef and Arpels. This manufacturing facility is one of the largest in Switzerland, rivalled only by the likes of Rolex and Omega. Since then, Cartier has accomplished many feats in the world of watch movements, including producing the flying tourbillon movement Calibre 9452 MC in 2007, the first in-house Cartier movement to receive the coveted Geneva seal. It also exhibited its ID1 watch in 2009, the first automatic watch that Cartier claims will never, in its life, require a service. Cartier have also been steadily and stealthily replacing the movements found in their current collection, including the Cartier Tank Solo XL, which features the in-house 1847 MC movement developed in 2015. It's time to discover what notable people have owned and worn this watch. Due to its iconic design, the list is long, and I've only featured a few of my favourites. Andy Warhol, the artist, film director and producer, owned and was often seen with his yellow gold Cartier tank. Asked about it, he said, I don't wear a tank to tell the time. Actually, I never even wind it. I wear a tank because it is the watch to wear. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, first lady during the presidency of John F. Kennedy, also wore the Cartier tank. This was later auctioned at Christie's in 2017 
and sold for 379,500 US dollars. Other famous wearers include Muhammad Ali, Calvin Klein, Yves Saint Laurent, Frank Sinatra, Clark Gable, Michelle Obama, Sofia Coppola, and Princess Diana, to name a few. I'd argue that no other watch model can boast of such a vast and highly notable clientele. The last thing I wanted to talk about is pricing. Due to the huge range of model variants within the Cartier tank collection, it has a relatively low barrier of entry. The most affordable tank is from the Cartier Muster tank collection. These can be had for as little as £700 or US$850 in decent condition. They come in various style configurations and either in a quartz or a manual wind movement. If you are purchasing one of these, make sure the gold plating is in good condition. The middle of the range tank is the Solo. This can be had brand new for around £3,000 or US$3,650. The Tank Solo XL is actually my favourite amongst the range. This is because, due to its stainless steel construction, I can wear it pretty much every day without having to worry about taking chunks out of a soft gold case. Furthermore, the in-house calibre 1847MC movement I discussed previously is really impressive and I think it's an important step forward for Cartier. The highest end tank variant in the range is the Louis Cartier or LC model. The cheapest LC tank comes in at £8,800 or US dollars but this features a quartz movement. If you were to go for an LC tank, I'd suggest the large model featuring the calibre 8971 in-house movement. This comes in at £11,100 or US dollars One of my grail watches is a tank LC skeleton, but at £43,900 or US dollars it's probably not happening anytime soon. In conclusion, the rich history of Cartier and the Cartier tank makes it clear that they deserve more respect within the watch world. Cartier's movement journey, from reliance on other brands to embracing courts, and finally to building a world-renowned movement manufacturing facility, is testament to the brand's resilient and entrepreneurial spirit. The long list of people who have worn this watch speaks for itself, and at such a relatively low cost, there's plenty of value for money here too. I hope you found this video informative. What watch model would you like to see me do a history of next? If you've enjoyed this video, please like, comment and subscribe. All the best, Rashid.